Well, I did it. I went into the Mundy's house. I figured the exterior was a good indication of what was to be expected inside. But what I discovered was so much worse than I could have imagined. I told you how they came down the mountain late at night. Well, they did it again. 1am seems to be their preferred time to do whatever they're doing. So I sat in the dark, peeking out the blinds, and watched the five younger Mundys walk past the house. And then trailing about 20 feet behind them was the old lady. She didn't stop and scream this time. She just hobbled past without even looking in my direction. I waited for them to get a ways down the road. And then I grabbed my weapon, put on my headlamp, and headed towards their house. Nighttime on the mountain is dark. There ain't any light pollution out here. So there is an added creepiness to the Monday house at night. People not from around here might look at the dark, decaying old house and assume it was long abandoned. But the reality is that it's been occupied longer than any other house on the mountain. Once on the property, I turned on my headlamp to cross the yard without tripping over the junk. As I said before, there's heaps of stuff thrown around here that doesn't make sense. Car parts, but no car. Kids' toys, but no kids. Maybe they're stealing this stuff during their late night excursions. I made it to the front door, which was easy enough to get through, considering nobody had locked it. Apparently they ain't worried about intruders. As I stepped inside, the first thing I noticed was the smell. It's by far the worst odor I've ever had the displeasure of inhaling. The second thing I noticed was the buzzing of flies. Lots of them. At that moment, I was confident I'd be finding a dead body. I plugged my nose and took another step down the hall I'd seen the old lady standing so many years ago. At one point it was wallpapered, much of which has peeled away over time. What remains is stained and dirty. The walls have holes in them. You can see into other rooms through these holes, and I could tell that the wood was old as the house itself. There'd obviously been no history of remodeling. With each step, I thought I would break through the floor, but by some miracle, it stayed strong. I entered a room to the left. By my understanding of typical house layouts, I'd say the room was at one point either a den or a dining room. But now it appeared to be a place where they slept and feces. That's right, they do it in the same room, both directly on the floor. Although, maybe the filthy pillows are used for something other than sleeping. I guess that's just wishful thinking on my part. The buzzing of the flies grew louder as I headed further towards the back of the house. I entered the kitchen and it became a roar. The room was host to more flies than I'd ever seen. The source of the smell was in there as well, and my stomach couldn't handle it. I tried my best to get outside, but I couldn't make it in time. I vomited in the hallway. Panic set in. They were going to see the vomit and know someone was in there. And after the incident the other night and then the blood on the window, I figured I'd be suspect number one. They don't have much for towels. Maybe none at all. So I grabbed one of those dirty pillows. I wiped up my mess, which at the time, I did consider that maybe they wouldn't even notice it. The house was that bad. They don't use pillowcases, so I just returned the pillow to the room and flipped it over so that the puke soak side was hidden. Honestly, the vomit ain't distracting much from the current condition of that pillow. I took a deep breath, plucked my nose, and headed back to the kitchen. I stepped in the swarm of flies. Keeping my eyes open was difficult. Not sure if you've ever come across an odor so foul your eyes burned, but that's what this was. Plus all the flies buzzing around my face. I realized that what the flies were circulating were several plastic buckets sitting on the floor. This was a Civil War era kitchen, by the way. No fridge. Just a wood-burning stove, moldy old cabinets, and buckets. Reluctantly, I stepped toward the buckets. I held my breath and looked inside, and once again, my stomach lurched. Inside were pounds of rotting meat. I couldn't tell from what, and I didn't have it in me to keep looking. I stormed out of the room and somehow managed to fight back the bile. 
I guess I know what they eat now. The house is two stories, and the stairs are in horrible condition. The railing is gone, and just about every other step is damaged. But I needed to know what was upstairs. However, as I walked back up the hall, I noticed something. There was a door below the stairs, and it was padlocked. Is it weird that I thought even a padlock would be too complicated for the Mondays? I didn't have anything on me to break the lock, and I sure as Merit wasn't going to shoot it. So I continued up the stairs. Three bedrooms. The first one I went into was small and full of children's clothes. Modern clothing. This was, of course, very alarming, as that's all that was in there. Just a massive pile of it. Do they have kids? Are they stealing kids' clothes? Or worse of all, are they stealing kids? Children do go missing out here occasionally. The second room was a similar size, maybe a bit larger. This room was severely damaged. There was a large hole in the floor, which allowed me to see back downstairs. The walls had sort of primitive artwork on it, like someone finger-painted on them. They didn't use paint, though. The color palette seemed limited to the colors that come out of the human body. Handprints, stick figures, shapes. But one thing left me deeply unsettled. There was a series of four numbers I recognized. My address. I moved on to the final room. The door was closed. I turned the knob and went in. This was the largest room. The master. Inside was one of the more shocking discoveries from the night. Aside from some dust, it was clean. And not only that, someone decorated it like an actual bedroom. There was a full-sized bed, a stand-up mirror, a chest of drawers, and nightstands. However, the furniture was ancient. Civil War era. Sitting on the nightstand was a framed picture, black and white, a man and a woman. It looked to be from the 1800s. They weren't smiling, as is often the case in pictures from that time. They weren't deformed like the Mondays are now. But they did look like siblings, similar faces and hair color. I recognized the dress on the woman as the one I'd seen the old lady wearing. It must be Levi and Sarah. The nightstand that the picture had been sitting on was positioned beneath an uncovered window, so I had turned off my headlamp not to draw attention. The light from the moon was sufficient enough. I turned my headlamp back on to snap a picture of the photograph, and when I did, I heard that familiar soul-piercing scream coming from the back of the house. I immediately shut off my light and looked out the window, and there they were. They were hurtling themselves up the steep incline of the mountain like animals. The lady was clinging to the back of one of the men, and she was staring right at me. I dropped the picture and ran. I lunged down the stairs as quickly as possible and out the house. I didn't turn back. I sprinted home, ran inside, and locked the door. The weapon hadn't left my side. I was happy to see the sunlight this morning and that the Mondays didn't come down the mountain after me, but I didn't get a lick of sleep. I can't call the police. There's nothing to report aside from my own trespassing. They had written my address on their wall in blood. Just the numbers, but that's enough to freak me out. And what's up with the children's clothes? My gut tells me I should take my parents and leave town for a bit. But I think I'm close to finding something big. I need to know what's happening in that padlocked room. And where do the Mondays go at night?